各位观众朋友，大家好。现在是北京时间三月二十二日晚八点。Dear good evening. It is 8 p.m. March the 22nd. This is the live streaming event organized by Health News and Mindery Chinese Solution Global Sharing. I'm a reporter from Health News, Liu Lixia. It's a pleasure to meet you online. Recently, with our country's national efforts to combat the outbreak of COVID-19, the situation of prevention and control of the epidemic continues to improve and achieve the positive periodic results. At present, the epidemic is spreading all over the world, and China is the first to launch a campaign against the epidemic and hence have accumulated many valuable experiences, hoping to share with the world. In this live streaming, we are fortunate to have four hospital managers fighting in the front line. They are Director Zhang Dingyu of Jingying Tan Hospital of Wuhan City, Director Liu Yongtao of the Third Hospital of Shandong Province, Director Liu Xingming of the First Hospital of Peking University, Deputy Director Chen Changliang of Henan Provincial People's Hospital, and Deputy Director Zhu Chouwen of Zhongshan Hospital, affiliated to Fudan University. Thank you for your support out of your busy schedule. They will share their valuable insight and experiences in the fight against the epidemic later. Also, we have the organizers of this event, Party Secretary and Director of Health News, Director Deng Haihua, and Senior Vice Director, Mr. Li Zaiwen from Mindry. First, please join me to welcome Party Secretary and Director of Health News, Deng Haihua, to deliver his remarks. Dear directors, experts, and colleagues, good evening. Welcome to the live streaming event of Chinese Solution Global Sharing, organized by Health News and supported by Mindry. On behalf of the organizers, I'd like to say a big thank you for your support and online attention. After the outbreak of COVID-19 in China, Chinese government attached great importance to it. General Secretary Xi Jinping himself has directed the efforts against the epidemic. The State Council has established a, a joint prevention and control mechanism. With our united strength and efforts, at present, China's domestic epidemic is going well with the order of production and people's lives being restored in an accelerated manner, we had periodic achievements in the prevention and control. General, Sec General Secretary Xi, upon visiting Wuhan city, he emphasized that the prevention and control of COVID-19 is a major test to our governance system and capability. There are lessons and experiences to be learned. It's necessary to look at the long term to fix our shortcomings and deficiencies, and to build a solid line to safeguard people's health and lives. Recently, with the global spread of the virus, there are over 180 countries and regions with uh, over 210,000 reported cases. Facing this uh, pandemic, to share Chinese valuable experiences in fighting against the epidemic is of instrumental and referential value to prevent it from further spreading. Therefore, Health News has invited the frontline hospital managers and experts with their first hundred experiences. They will share the real-time scenario of uh, prevention and control, and how to effectively mobilize medical resources. And all these uh, dialogues will be broadcasted through this platform to share and introduce Chinese anti-epidemic solutions in a rapid way. I hope today's live streaming can be fruitful and play an instrumental role in promoting global anti-epidemic work. In the end, I wish this live streaming a full success. Thank you. Thank you, Director Deng. As the most influential industry media supervised by the National Health Commission of China, the health news has played an instrumental role in a news report of the epidemic prevention and control and the dissemination of relevant science and has covered many influential events. 
At present, the health news also has a number of reporters in Wuhan. I also hope my colleagues will return soon and safe and sound. Coming next, please join me to welcome the Vice President from Mindary, Mr. Li Zaiwen, to deliver his remarks. 尊敬的登海华社长，尊敬的各位来自全球的医院领导及专家。Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and good afternoon. First of all, on behalf of Mindre, please allow me to extend the highest respect, the most heartfelt thanks, and the most sincere blessing to all, to all the medical workers around the world fighting against COVID-19. The theme of today's webinar is Chinese solution global sharing. At present, the COVID-19 outbreak has become a serious global public health challenge. Although countries around the world are in different phases of fighting against the novel coronavirus and their medical systems and technology levels are diverse, we firmly believe that openness, sharing and collaboration are key for us to defeat the pandemic. As the first country affected by COVID-19 pandemic, China has accumulated much experience and effective methods in combating the coronavirus. We hope to make a contribution to the international community for maintaining global health security by sharing our experiences and best practices. A few days ago, based on our efforts in combating the novel coronavirus, the National Health Commission of China, NHC, summarized Chinese solution in which NHC shares Chinese experiences in multiple aspects from epidemic prevention and control, diagnosis and treatment to material support and so on. As one of the leading medical equipment suppliers in China market, Mindray has made positive contributions to epidemic tackling in diagnosis, treatment, and material support. We extensively mobilize our employees and our upstream and downstream partners to take the lead in work resumption on the second day of Chinese Spring Festival holiday and immediately delivered nearly 3,000 medical devices to Huoshenshan and Leishenshan Hospital, the two newly constructed hospitals in Wuhan designated for COVID-19 case treatment, and then delivered more than 50,000 units to the hospitals across China. Mindry is also planning to deliver more than 10,000 devices to Italy in near future and provide more equipment and solutions to countries around the world. Under the background of worldwide epidemic prevention, to fulfill the urgent and special demands, Mindry is capable of providing with one-stop service nearly 70% of the devices required by the infectious disease hospitals covering the core departments such as clinical laboratory, ICU, emergency department, and medical imaging department. With its products and services, Mindray offers powerful support to hospitals for their overall configuration and standardized equipment management. Intelligentized and easy using equipments of Mindray help to improve the efficiency of medical staff and shorten the training time. The devices featuring automation and being easy for disinfection also help to reduce oscomial infection. The epidemic situation changes rapidly, and there is possibility for the virus to mutate. And the different medical ecology in various countries will continue to affect the evolution of the epidemic. Therefore, the Chinese solution shared today will also keep progressing into Italian solution, European solution, and finally a global solution gathering the wisdom of the medical professionals ar around the world. As a provider of medical devices and solutions, Mindray has been respecting the diverse conditions of each country in the world. It will focus on closer communications and collaborations and try to deliver the supplies being most urgently needed in the most effective and optimized way. We brace for contributing more to the global solution in the aspects of material support, diagnosis and treatment. Today, medical experts around the world share the same mission of defending the lives and health of people. I firmly believe that the epidemic will be brought under control and finally defeated. Because the cooperation network knitted with our expertise and joint efforts does work. At last, I wish this global webinar a great success, and I wish we will win the war against the novel coronavirus as soon as possible. I wish all the present experts to take care of yourselves. Thank you all. Thank you, Li Zong. Thank you, Director Li, and thank Mindry for your contribution.
I hope that Chinese solution, together with other nation solutions, can form a global solution. Coming next, we'll enter into today's main session. Please join me to welcome the frontline hospital managers to share their experiences and feeling. Speaking of uh, the Jing Tan Hospital in Wuhan, it is not unfamiliar for many. Jing Tan Hospital is a specialized hospital for infectious diseases and one of the first three designated hospitals in Wuhan to treat severe patients with COVID-19. Over a month ago, it was called the storm center of the epidemic, and the director of Jing Tan Hospital, Zhang Dingyu, became the person standing in the eye of the storm. Before the live streaming event, Director Zhang received an interview in the hospital office. He gave a few responses to questions, including the initial cases and initial admittances. Please refer to the screen. One patient was transferred from another hospital to ours. As an infectious disease hospital, we will naturally protect ourselves and meanwhile isolate all the patients. At about 9 p.m. on the 29th, we accepted the patient directly. We took full protective measures and used negative pressure ambulance. The referring doctors, nurses and porters, none of them were infected. They went to pick up the patients wearing protective clothing. If they had gone out unprepared and they got infected, it would have been my fault. We required working personnel to wear protective clothing and use negative pressure ambulance to pick up the patients. When did the peak in severe cases suddenly begin? Severe cases rose day by day rather than increasing suddenly in one day, just as people think. The peak of outbreak occurred after the Spring Festival, when Chinese government issued a policy requiring leaving no COVID-19 patients unattended, and all severe cases should be sent to hospital. That was very stressful for us. It was on, on around February the 2nd when there came a peak. Our hospital was mainly a referral hospital, so we took on a lot of responsibilities in this aspect. We needed to take in all the patients from outside. There must have been more severe cases, right? There were a lot of severe cases, accounting for about 60 or 70 percent. Jin Tan Hospital soon received hundreds of patients. Do you think Jin Tan Hospital could treat them properly or by itself at that time? From the very beginning, it has been given very high attention by the health commissions at the national, provincial and municipal level. It's not just general attention, but instead very high attention. After the New Year's Eve meeting held on January the 1st, we already had a national expert group in our hospital. The experts had consultation for patients, no matter ICU patients or ordinary patients. There were 24 patients in total. None of them was missed. And on January the 3rd, an expert group from Hubei province was set up to help us with the treatment. At that time, apart from our team, teams from other hospitals were busy working in the ICU of our hospital for support and guidance. So I just want to emphasize here that we had not been fighting alone from the very beginning. We were a great team working together because I didn't have the ability to mobilize resources from Hubei province and other hospitals. It is 
the result of mobilization of the entire health system, from the country to Hubei Province, then to Wuhan City. Later, we began to admit more and more inpatients. After January the tenth, there were more than one hundred patients, but we only had fourteen beds in the ICU, which were obviously not enough. Then we successfully opened the second ward and the third ward. However, I did not make this decision alone. This honor belonged to our great team. I think it should be attributed to experts' guidance because they warned me earlier that there might be more critical cases, and the second and third ICU should be prepared immediately. We had doubted about the soaring of critical inpatients. But what happened later proves that these experts were right. We just followed the experts' instructions without hesitation. If the experts had given me a prompt, but I hadn't followed, that would be my dereliction of duty. So what I want to say is that this is definitely not the achievement of one single person. It's really the result of collective intelligence. As many experts from national and provincial hospitals gathered at Jinyin Tan Hospital for support, were the early stage researchers on this disease basically carried out in Jinyin Tan Hospital. We did well in specimen supporting. Also, we did some work in the discovery of this virus. On January the third, we were asked to provide the patient's serum specimen. It's one of our hospital's tradition to provide the patient's specimens for a long period, and we have established our own specimen library. At that time, Wuhan Institute of Virology, Chinese Academy of Sciences, called for the serum specimen of one of our patients. With the serum specimen we provided, they made tests and discovered that the titer of the antibody in this serum presented fourfold increasing or more. It wasn't quadrupled; it was increased by sixteen times. So to speak, the two two evidences identifying that the virus was a new virus were provided it by our hospital. One was the discovery of nucleic acids. And gene sequences, and the other was a finding that the titer of antibody in the serum was fourfold increasing. Another job we did for such research was based on our GCP team. By the end of 2019, our hospital obtained the clinical evaluation technology platform for major new drug innovation and major. Major special drug development technology from the Ministry of Science and Technology. We are responsible for the research of this project, which is actually the GCP platform and the national platform. Our GCP team is very solid and powerful, and is sensitive enough to seize the, the opportunities. Chao Bin, one of our professors. Talked about antivirals as early as on January the first. He recommended two drugs, of which one needed to be imported, and the other was remdesivir. Remdesivir is a drug for AIDS. As our hospital provides treatment for AIDS cases, the drug was available in our inventory, although. It was not a rigorous clinical study. We had been administering this medicine to patients since January the sixth. This research project got approved and initiated on around January the eighth. After ethic committee review and project initiation training, the project was officially launched on around January eleventh. 
considering provincial experts came and the national expert group was here, why was the mortality rate still so high? It had something to do with the characteristics of the disease. We couldn't understand that at the beginning. After learning about the characteristics of the disease, we think the mortality is understandable. The post-mortem examination of quite some dead patients indicates that endotracheal intubation had not been carried out for them before they died. These patients were diagnosed as severe but not critical cases. That their symptoms were not critical. However, they died before developing serious enough to have endotracheal intubation. From the postmortem examination of the twelve dead patients, we can see that they died suddenly before developing into critical cases to accept intubated treatment. They died of complete damage of lungs. From the autopsy results, we can see that the patients. Alveoli were completely stuffed. The alveoli collapsed, and the structure was damaged. Only a few lung units had been working for a long time. The function of alveolar expansion was lost. Hypoxia or chronic hypoxia caused damages in other organs. Of course, there were other factors, such as. Heart damage and liver damage. In fact, the virus destroys lungs seriously, so it doesn't make sense to talk about mortality right now. There is another reason. At that time, the base of statistics was very small, so the absolute mortality seemed high. The death rate would remain high, very high, if no new cases were reported. Now the number of confirmed cases is huge, so the death rate declines. Yes, small base was one of the reasons, and the earliest cases were probably severe and critical ones. Yes, the patients admitted to hospital were dying. Did you feel stressful back then? Yes, definitely, because. It was my responsibility. The patients were handed over to us. We saw them dying, but could do nothing. In early days, endotracheal intubation meant that the final treatment for the patients. We saw them dying, but we cannot do anything. So in early days, an endotracheal intubation operation meant the death. It started out like this, but then the experts came and the treatment solution was adjusted. We thought the patients would be saved if we managed to make them breathe on their own with high flow and non-invasive oxygen supply, which helps to reduce infection or other problems associated with invasive ventilation. In fact. It is a process of learning. Violent cough and breathing will cause lung damage, even without endotracheal intubation. Patients in ICU were quite anxious. A 40-year-old woman who was conscious thought she was going to die during high-flow oxygen treatment, and she kept saying she wanted to go home. The doctor had to keep comforting her. You can't go home in such a situation. Instead, you should actively cooperate with the doctors and nurses during treatment, because we are excellent and we are willing to help you. Don't be scared off. Although we look like monsters in protective gowns, with the goggles and masks on. The patient calmed down gradually. Finally, she recovered and was discharged. Director Zhang, we know some of your colleagues, families, and friends were also infected. How how did you feel?
Were you scared or not? Of course, I was scared. I felt scared when my colleagues and then my wife were were infected, because I knew the disease. Especially in the early days, you didn't know the evolution of the disease. It seemed to be okay when you knew nothing about it at first, as most viral diseases are self-cure diseases. Some infected patients healed by themselves. But others became critically ill, and the outcome is irreversible. Even endotracheal intubation was of no avail. ECMO didn't help either. Then you felt horrible, anxious, and fearful. We have two colleagues infected. One of them were found critical when the symptoms occurred. He was the first among our colleagues to get infected. And he was quite clear about where he was infected. As we were very confident in remdesivir at that time, he asked to take this medicine. But then remdesivir began to work. He was discharged a week ago. However, his lungs were damaged so severely that his lung functions needed to be maintained with continuous oxygen therapy. Even after he was discharged, he was in hospital for nearly an entire month, and he was kept in hospital because his lung has suffered a severe, severe damage. Another patient is my colleague's father. The father stopped taking remdesivir as he suffered a lot of gastrointestinal re- reaction. Then his status got worse and worse. Although endotracheal intubation and ECMO had been adopted, he eventually died. And Director Zhang, when did your wife find herself get infected? She was confirmed on January nineteenth. Her symptoms were very typical. On January fourteenth, she felt a little uncomfortable and had a low fever. So she conducted a CT scan, the result of which revealed that there was indeed a problem. Then she had her throat swabbed. The test result was positive. She was soon hospitalized. It was really a difficult time. I had to face a huge stress from both the hospital and my family. The stress doubled, and did you have enough time to rest? I almost had no rest time. In most cases, I slept in the duty room. Sometimes, about every two to three days, I was able to go home for a sleep. Director Zhang, there is one more question. It's about autopsy, which drew great attention. In fact, you had been trying to do autopsy from the very beginning. Up till now, all the autopsies have been done in your hospital, right? Out of the thirteen autopsies, twelve were successfully successfully mobilized by us. At the beginning, due to insufficient knowledge of laws and regulations and a lack of policy support, we failed to persuade the patients' families. Later, based on the requirement of NHC, the Health Commission of Hubei Province promoted the implementation of autopsy, 
and we were then required to complete ten autopsies within the week. At that time, we thought it was a、uh, mission impossible, but instead we turned out over fulfilling the task by doing two to three autopsies per day. According to the Article Forty Six of the Law of the PRC on the Prevention and Treatment of Infectious Diseases, in order to find the cause of the infection diseases, a medical institution may, when necessary, conduct autopsy on the corpses of patients with infectious diseases, and shall inform the same to the family of the deceased. From the video, we understand that for COVID-19, early detection, diagnosis, quarantine, and treatment are critical to avoid mild cases from turning into severe ones. I believe these experiences are of value for some countries in the climbing period against the epidemic. Here, we also hope that Director Zhang will take care of himself. Coming next is a.、Uh, Director Liu Xinming from Peking University Fast Hospital. Since January 26, the first batch of、uh, Hubei anti-epidemic medical team was dispatched to Wuhan. Over a hundred Peking University Hospital medical staff came to the rescue of Hubei. They have contributed significantly to taking over wards, treating critical patients, and reducing mortality. Director Liu went to Wuhan on February the first with the second batch of medical teams. At present, he is still in the front line of treating severe patients in Zhongfa Xincheng District of Tongqi Hospital in Wuhan. Please give the floor to Director Liu. Time flies. We have been here in Wuhan for almost two months. The strong desire for fighting against the coronavirus we cherished when landing in Wuhan. Is still vivid in my mind. At that time, the city was just locked down and seemed quite miserable. The mortality of severe virus patients was very high. The whole nation felt heartbroken. Wuhan's healthcare system, including Tongji Hospital Sino-French New City Branch (SFNCB), was basically overwhelmed. To respond to the government's call of leaving no COVID-19 patients unattended, SFNCB, where we were working, upheld the principle. So within a week, we converted all the wards of the hospital with 1,200 beds into ICU wards. We were appointed to take over the hospital as a whole, 50 beds per ward. We converted them from general wards to ICUs. There were many patients back then who had been admitted to different community hospitals or other hospitals, but there were severe cases of coronavirus. Secondly, medical equipments were far from enough, including the oxygen supply along the walls of wards. With general wards, the design for general wards accommodating one thousand two hundred beds, the design was based on therapeutic purpose. When they were converted to respiratory ICUs with the same number of beds, you know, for respiratory pneumonia, oxygen therapy is critical for treating respiratory failure. Oxygen supply is a must. Therefore, the conversion includes renovation of oxygen gas circuits and pipelines. For those that could not be renovated, we took the simplest way, the old-fashioned way, using oxygen tanks. We also faced difficulties in equipment and in PPE. However, we managed to respond to various challenges with the coordination of local hospitals, and solved them one by one. Within less than three days, we converted the general wards into respiratory ICUs. This is my first point of sharing. Second, our Peking University First Hospital. Dispatched 136 medical workers to Wuhan for this battle. More than 130 people with a doctor-to-nurse ratio of one to three. Among the excellent doctors and nurses, most of them came from the respiratory department, critical care medicine department, and infectious disease department. Many of these doctors and nurses had participated 
in the fighting against SARS in 2003. They are experienced in dealing with respiratory diseases, especially critical illness. So they were able to adapt to the situation quickly. We divided our staff into several teams, including medical care team, infection control team. We strived to figure out ways to treat patients. As for our physicians, most of them hold certificate of physicians and deputy chiefs, with more than ten years of professional career in our hospital. They are clinically experienced. That is exactly the reason why I say we are a powerful team, representing the quality and capability of our hospital. It's the second point. You know, Peking University First Hospital is one of our national teams. It was founded one hundred and five years ago. We are quite experienced in treating critical illnesses. We have multidisciplinary advantages. We have world-class expertise and talents. All these edges gather and come into play. Patients' treatments are conducted under scientific and tiered management. With such a strategy, we invited the experts from three branch hospitals under Peking University Medical School and organized consultations. In addition, our team in Wuhan was supported by remote consultations for our staff in Beijing. With such measures taken, we think the treatment outcomes were quite optimal. Within less than two months, we treated almost one hundred severe patients. So far, most of them have well recovered. COVID nineteen pneumonia is a new disease. We encounter various difficulties in treating patients, especially the severe cases. The mortality of critically ill patients is very high. The mortality of elderly critically ill patients is even higher. The elderly usually suffer from multiple underlying diseases. With the multidiscipline advantages, talents, and expertise of Peking University First Hospital, we have adopted. The unique solution featuring scientific classification and conducted targeted treatment. In our team, we have experts on endocrinology, digestion, and immunology. We classify patients scientifically. We divide the patients into mild, moderate, and severe groups, singling out patients with mild symptoms and isolating those with moderate symptoms. For each severe patient, a specific treatment group was assigned to design the treatment plan for him or her. The team members held frequent discussions and joint consultations. When the patient's condition was related to a specific discipline, the doctors of that discipline were invited to participate. So basically, each patient received a personalized treatment. Also, as I said. We mobilize the resources of other hospitals affiliated to Peking University. Three hospitals in total organized joint consultation on challenging and complicated cases. We also counted on the support from our headquarters. We need the support from our headquarters, the support from other relevant disciplines. The headquarters provided us with strong support. A treatment must be science-based. Apart from scientific treatment, humanitarian care is also essential. Some patients with COVID-19, when they were admitted to our hospital, especially those severe cases, they were in a sheer panic, even in despair. Sometimes they were reluctant to be retreated. For those, we should provide humanitarian care. In our medical team. Two physicians are origi originally from Wuhan, and they can speak local Wuhan dialect. So we arrange them to work in daytime shifts to enable them communicate more with patients, especially those with severe symptoms, to ease up their anxiety and to boost their confidence, so that they could be cooperative. On nursing, 
Our nurses, on intensive nursing care, put their hearts into patient care, and therefore reduced complications. This is a new disease. Our understanding is still limited. We are still learning and exploring. For instance, antiviral treatment. So far, we haven't identified a specific medicine against it. So when we use antiviral medicine, try to simplify the medication plan. Many of the patients admitted were transferred from elsewhere. They had been treated with three to four antiviral drugs. We didn't think it's reasonable, and it would only hurt patients given the drug's toxicity. It would hurt patients' hepatic and renal functions. So, based on our empirical experience, clinical and evidence-based medical evidence, and literature reference, we prescribed medicine that were truly effective, that were suitable for his or her hepatic and renal circumstances, and suitable for his or her age group. Such treatments were targeted. For others, such as mechanical ventilation, when to use invasive. Or non-invasive testament. For this pneumonia, moving forward, late-stage screening should be emphasized. This is the key: mastering mechanical ventilation, vitals monitoring, and indications. These are all essential. Also, glucocorticoid treatment. During SARS epidemic, for a while, we prescribed large doses of glucocorticoid, but afterwards. Some patients were found to have osteonecrosis of the femoral head (ONFH) and some other complications. To treat COVID-19 patients, we suggest moderate dosing in the early phase, based on our expertise. Adopt moderate dosing as part of a reasonable treatment plan. Psychotherapists conducted remote consultations to relieve patients' anxiety. All these measures are important. We had a patient in extreme despair. He rejected our treatment, but with proactive psychotherapy and working other aspects, like helping him get in touch with his family, he was relieved and gaining confidence. Confidence is vital. Once he lighted up, he was very cooperative in the treatment, and the treatment outcome is unexpectedly good. Okay. Our team members are outstanding. They do their job very well every day. Our patients and every one of us are deeply impressed. We have many touching stories. Let me tell you two. The first one: mother and daughters joined the battle together. The daughter is a nurse of critical care medicine. When SARS outbroke in 2003, she was still a kid. Her mother, as a chief nurse, joined the battle against SARS. The daughter is now a grown-up after 17 years. Today, she is so brave to join the fight on the front line against COVID-19 as a nurse. It's very touching. Another thing I would like to share is that patients suffering this disease. Tend to panic. As I said, back then, the healthcare system was disarrayed. Patients were transferred from one place to another, from community hospital to another hospital, then to SFNCB. Many of them suffered from family clustering infection. For example, one old man's spouse has passed away. His daughter and grandchild were quarantined elsewhere. And he was isolated in our ward, losing contact with his family. In that situation, the patient was much reluctant to receive treatment. So our chief nurse came up with an idea, actively helping him get in touch with his family. We treat we reached out to the police and the local hospitals, helping this patient to keep in touch with his daughter. After that, the patient was very cooperative. And he also became confident on his recovery. These are some of the touching stories happening in our hospitals every day. In the interest of time, I share with you only these two examples.
Currently, at SFNCP, in the past, it was patients waiting for a bed, but now it is the contrary: beds waiting for patients. We are now wrapping things up. There are only six to seven patients left in our ward. Two of them have not shaken off ventilation. That we strive to do our best till the last minute. Our last step is to help some of the patients fully recover, and to transfer the rest to other hospitals. According to central government's plan, we will be able to return to Beijing at the end of this month. For the current status of Wuhan, I have been being cautiously optimistic. Now, as you can see, for Wuhan and Hubei as a whole, both the increase of confirmed cases and that of suspected cases are single digit. Hubei finally reported zero new suspected cases. As to confirmed cases, for more than ten days, the number of new cases has been zero. However, despite the good news, according to NHC, there are still one to two dispersed cases identified in the outpatient department, signaling that we shouldn't be complacent. So we can be optimistic, but we should also remain precautious. Second, after our return to Beijing, after a break. We are bound to throw ourselves into another bottle. According to the NHC's figure on Beijing, the number of imported cases, in particular, has been growing significantly and even nationwide. So we will continue our battle against COVID-19 in Beijing. Peking University First Hospital is a time-honored hospital with 105 years of tradition. Our hospital's fate is tied with our nation's fate, from the war of resistance against Japanese aggression to the Liberation War and the Korean War, and multiple natural disasters, such as earthquakes and floods. Medical workers of Peking University First Hospital were there on the front line doing our job. We were also active in the aid programs of Xinjiang and Tibet region, the poverty. Alleviation initiatives, so we are capable of and confident in winning the battle this time. As for myself, I am a respiratory physician. What I am doing is part of my daily work. In 2003, I was appointed as the expert of first consultation in the hospital. To me, this is part of my job, and I will try my very best. I have been saying that we have two tasks: first, to ensure zero infections of our team members, and bring our physicians and nurses back to Beijing safe and sound. Our work in Wuhan will be finished in around ten days. So now I am confident about the first task: we can make it. Secondly, to fulfill national targets and reduce mortality. As I mentioned, we have carried out refined scientific and tiered management. With this strategy, we've come up with our own solutions and achieved favorable outcomes. Thank you, Director Liu. We see the distinctive banner of the medical team of Peking University First Hospital behind him. The first hospital of Peking University is a hospital with a long history and with rich experience in the treatment of critical patients. Director Liu also pointed out that due to the complex condition of COVID-19 severe patients, the use of comprehensive and multidisciplinary diagnosis and treatment is very important. Coming next, from Shandong Provincial Third Hospital, Director Liu Yongtao. Director Liu. Is the chief leader of Shandong Province's eighth batch of medical team to assist Hubei. He was leading the medical personnel stationed in Wuhan Mobile Cabin Hospital to treat patients. At present, Director Liu has returned to Shandong under quarantine. We would like to ask Director Liu to share the management and anti-epidemic action of the Mobile Cabin Hospital. Please. <laughs> 
The floor is yours. Hello, everyone, honorable experts, and dear audience. I'm Liu Yongtao, the director of Shandong Provincial Third Hospital. Today, I will introduce the management of a makeshift hospital during the epidemic and the anti-epidemic actions. From February ninth to March seventeenth, twenty twenty. I led Shandong's eighth batch of medical team rushing to Hubei Province, and worked in Wuhan Hanyang Makeshift Hospital for more than thirty days. I was appointed as the deputy director of this makeshift hospital, and mainly responsible for medical rescue. As one of the fourteen makeshift hospitals in Wuhan, Hanyang Makeshift Hospital. Got ready for patients' treatment at 4 p.m. on February the 11th. Our medical team and I were the earliest team that entered the hospital, and we'd been working there until it closed on March the 8th. There are 960 beds in Hanyang Makeshift Hospital. Shandong Medical Team was responsible for medical treatment of 480 beds. We have totally treated 599 patients, among whom 291 were transferred, and 308 were cured and discharged. From this diagram, we can see that the makeshift hospital opened on February 11th, and we found the number of admitted patients soared on February 12th. In fact, before they were hospitalized, these patients were at home or the community. There were fourteen makeshift hospitals in Wuhan totally, from February fourth to February seventeenth. In less than half a month, fourteen makeshift hospitals were built. The makeshift hospitals got support from twenty-two national emergency medical rescue teams, three national mobile PC laboratories, and more than thirty medical teams arrived in two batches, and fourteen nurse, fifteen nursing teams. Including a team of radiographers, a total of more than seven thousand medical workers gathered to serve the makeshift hospitals in such a short period of time. By March the tenth, the forty makeshift hospitals in Wuhan accomplished their historical missions. We set wrap up operation, meaning that it might be necessary for us to get ready at any time. We were also waiting orders. By then, more than thirteen thousand beds had been offered, actually, by the makeshift hospitals in Wuhan. We had received more than twelve thousand patients in total, accounting for a quarter of the total number of coronavirus cases in Wuhan. As for the background of building makeshift hospitals, as what I said just now. They were founded in a very urgent situation. Coronavirus broke out in Wuhan, Hubei in January, and the number of cases kept rising. Medical resources, especially the beds for confirmed cases, were far from enough. As a result, many confirmed patients could not be hospitalized for isolation and treatment in a timely manner, which increased cross infection in communities and the virus spread widely. Therefore, at 10 a.m. on January 23rd, Wuhan, a metropolis with a population of more than 10 million, announced lockdown. On January 25th, the General Secretary Xi proposed four concentrations at a meeting of the Standing Committee of the Political Bureau, namely concentrating the patients, the experts, the resources, and concentrated treatment. To implement. The spirit of the general secretary's instructions. On February the third, Wuhan decided to sort the patients for co-responding treatments. Also, Wuhan announced to open makeshift hospitals supported by the national emergency medical rescue teams and medical teams from Wuhan in various provinces and cities across the country to hospitalize mild cases of the novel coronavirus. For concentrated treatment, in this way, treatment based on scientific classification was achieved. 
effectively control the source of infection, cut off the spread routes, improve the cure rate, and reduce mortality. On February the twelfth, the general secretary emphasized again on the meeting of standing committee to improve the rate of treatment and cure, reduce the rate of infection and mortality, and must follow the principle of leaving no COVID nineteen patients unattended. Before arriving in Wuhan, we had not understood the principle thoroughly, but when we arrived there, we found that there were indeed a huge number of patients, which was just as like Academia Wang Chen said. And when our makeshift hospital opened, Academia Wang Chen came to visit us. The initiation of makeshift hospitals was carried out at the darkest hour of Wuhan. The actual situation was what you just saw in the chart. At that time, it was hard to find even a bed in Wuhan's hospitals. Tens of thousands of patients are trapped in their homes or the communities. Wuhan's medical systems was overwhelmed at that time. If the patients could not get treatment in time, it would be difficult to control the development of the epidemic. Therefore, the central government carried out the principle of Leaving no COVID-19 patients unattended as a guidance of anti-epidemic work, the makeshift hospitals were initiated and implemented under such a background. In less than two months, 12,000 patients with mild symptoms were treated at the makeshift hospitals, which reversed the passive situation of pandemic prevention. What is a makeshift hospital? Actually, it originally refers to the field hospital in wartime. It features high mobility and multifunction, including diverse facilities such as X-ray machine, surgery units, and sterilization facilities. The makeshift hospital had been used for rescuing the patients during Wenchuan earthquake. However, building so many makeshift hospitals for infectious diseases in such a short time was the first time in human history. Academia Wang Chen said that pneumonia caused by the novel coronavirus had a feature, that is, 80% to 85% of patients are mild cases, which can even be self-cured, or just need some standard symptomatic medical care. At the same time, be vigilant of the evolution trend towards severe cases. The most important thing is to isolate these patients. So that they will not act as a source of infection, leading to widespread of the epidemic. Therefore, we should build asylum hospitals with certain medical conditions. The full name of such kind of hospital, according to Academia Wang Chen, should be makeshift asylum hospitals, shortened as makeshift hospitals. I think. What are the basic functions of a makeshift hospital? First, isolation, namely. To let the admitted patients stay at the isolation wards of the makeshift hospital, to cut off the infection caused by family and social connection. The second is treatment. For the mild cases of coronavirus, we offer the medical care according to the laws and characteristics of the disease. Third is monitoring, which helps medical personnel to discover in time which patients are getting worse. Compared with those patients who stayed at home, patients in makeshift hospitals were taken good care of by the medical personnel who would be able to discover immediately when the, their symptoms worsen. Among the 599 patients admitted in our hospital, more than 200 was discovered timely when their symptoms changed. They were transferred to designated hospitals for intensive treatment immediately. Makeshift hospitals have three characteristics. First, large capacity. For example, the makeshift hospital at which we worked is actually an exhibition center called Wuhan Guobo. Some of the makeshift hospitals were located at the stadium or a warehouse, which were renovated to meet general medical requirements. Large capacity means a large number of patients could be hospitalized. The first three makeshift hospitals offered a total of three thousand four hundred beds to patients. At that time, when the bed is hard to find in Wuhan, makeshift hospitals 
really relieved a lot of pressure of, of admission. A large number of patients were directed to makeshift hospitals from their homes. Community spreading was largely reduced, and patient treatment was enhanced. Second, high efficiency. A makeshift hospital can be renovated in one or two days. Taking our hospitals as an example, we gathered together on February the ninth. We went into hospital on the February tenth to investigate. You can see Mayor Joe of Wuhan in this picture. We discussed together in the hospital. At that time, the renovation just began. While at four p.m. on February the eleventh, the hospital was built into operation. It took just two days. It had basic sick beds and was divided into polluted areas, buffer areas, and non-polluted areas. It met the basic requirements of three zones and two channels to prevent nosocomial infection. It had the fundamental medical facilities and was put into operation in a very short time. Thirdly, low cost, with existing spaces, only beds, partitions, bedside tables, etc., needed to be added. And remodeled temporary toilets. Our hospital had 50 mobile toilets, and on top of that, installed some basic facilities. The cost was significantly lower than those of ordinary hospitals, and that is how a makeshift hospital operates. Our operation aims to centrally isolate and treat confirmed mild cases of coronavirus from various communities. Controlling the source of infection is the main target to avoid cross-contamination in the community, and to conduct integrated disease education and psychological counselling, and give patients scientific treatment timely to prevent their disease from worsening, reduce the ratio of critical cases and mortality. Because such a makeshift hospital is formed temporarily. It shows one of the advantages of our country. Our makeshift hospitals were under the un unified leadership of the local government headquarters. Temporary party committees assumed full responsibility, of which I was one of the members. The secretary was fully responsible for the coordination of party committee construction. The director was fully responsible for the operation and management of the hospital. As the deputy director of this makeshift hospital, I was what responsible for the medical work of the medical operation team. We were mainly divided into four groups. One was the comprehensive information group, being responsible for coordinating the operation plan, including some material issues. The second was the medical operation group, which was mainly responsible for the designation and implementation of the core institution and procedures related to the medication plan, especially the summary of information. The third was the nosocomial infection control group. This was also a requirement for good protection. We also achieved the three zeros. There were deaths of patients. There were infection among medical staffs, and there were return of discharged patients to makeshift hospitals. We were required to achieve the targets, so it was very important. To conduct protection, especially for medical personnel, personnel without qualified training was not allowed to enter the makeshift hospitals. The fourth was the logistic support team, including ensuring patients' daily life and the maintenance of social facilities, and also supply of some medicines, disposal of medical waste, etc. Although this hospital was set up temporarily. It was all-encompassing and quite complicated. Coordination meetings was held at least once a day. Each group reported the problems they encountered during the meetings. We implemented group shifts and the total duty system. We focused on communication with each other to find and solve problems in time. Some management regulations were worked out quickly for our makeshift hospitals. Including case management principles, case admission criteria, treatment measures in hospitals, patient identity verification system, and checking system.
discharge standards and procedures, critical referral criteria, handling of disagreement during consultation system, and the treatment and rescue procedures when patient symptoms change. Here, I will introduce the standard of patient treatment in makeshift hospital. Six items in total. The first is for mild cases, who featured mild clinical symptoms. Manifestations of pneumonia were not seen in the imaging materials, but the nucleic acid test result was positive. Some of them had only general symptoms, such as fever, respiratory symptoms, but were not very serious. If imaging materials showed the manifestation of pneumonia, it meant symptoms in imaging mater material changed. Secondly, the patients were able to live independently and walk on their own. This is also important. Thirdly, the patients didn't have basic diseases, including serious dysfunction of important organs such as the heart, liver, lung, brain, kidney, and etc. Fourth. No history of mental illness, and fifth, the blood oxygen saturation at the resting state should be no less than ninety-three percent, and the breathing rate should be less than thirty times per minute. Six, some other issues to be specifically explained. We mainly follow the pre previous five rules to determine whether or not to hospitalize a patient. So, what plans did we take for diagnosis and treatment in the makeshift hospital? The most important work for us was to monitor the patient's vital signs and oxygen saturation closely, as a change in oxygen saturation may be a very important signal to tell symptom exacerbation. To collect the patient's throat swabs regularly, and please look at the picture below, which is a photo of collecting the patient's throat swabs. As for CT, we started to build a temporary 16-row CT inspection area on the third day after the opening of our hospital. This test did alleviate some of the patients' concerns. Special examinations were carried out by the medical team leader on duty based on some changes of patients' condition. Secondly, general treatments, including supportive care for patients. Ensuring sufficient calories, strengthening physiological counseling. All patients were required to wear face masks in the hospitals, which were distributed every day. Thirdly, the oxygen therapy. If the blood ox oxygen saturation is lower than 95, the patient needs nasal oxygen supply. We got the oxygen from the oxygen tanks. The fourth, drug treatments, including antiviral treatments. Everyone knows that we have not found a specific medicine for the treatment. We mainly use some antiviral medicines such as Arbidol and also Termivir. If a case was considered a bacterial infection, we also gave him or her antibiotic treatment: Mecofloxacin, Levofloxacin, and Erythromycin were used for five to seven days as one treatment course. The fifth was while traditional Chinese medicine treatment. Each of our patients took a dose of traditional Chinese medicine. Traditional Chinese medicine therapy had been proposed since the fifth version of guidelines on the novel coronavirus infected pneumonia diagnosis and treatment. The sixth, symptomatic treatment. If patients coughed or had low fever, we gave them symptomatic treatment. We also stipulated standards for the transfer of severe cases. If one of the following standards was met, the patient would be transferred. For example, respiratory distress, 30 or more breaths per minute, or resting blood oxygen saturation was less than 93 percent, etc. Persistent high fever, body temperature exceeding 38.5 degrees for more than two days. These were the standards of transferring to designated hospitals. At the same time, we stipulated discharge standards. Body temperature being normal for more than three days. In fact, we were stricter. 
generally more than seven days. Secondly, significant improvement of respiratory symptoms without coughing. Thirdly, comparing the lung CT results before and after treatment to see if inflammation was absorbed obviously. Based on these standards, the three-level expert system would determine whether or not the patient should be discharged. The first was group level, then the makeshift hospital level, and finally the joint discussion. A key rule was that negative nucleic acid test results had to be seen twice. The interval between the two tests had to be longer than one day. The fifth, in the case of no oxygen inhalation, fingertip oxygen saturation should be greater than 95%. What's more important is that the entire cause of the disease must exceed 14 days. The patients had to meet all of these criteria, but we agreed to get them discharged. Finally, I also want to talk about some suggestions and reflections for makeshift hospitals. As medical workers from traditional hospitals, we felt hectic in the beginning when we worked at the makeshift hospital. My first suggestion is to unify the directives, strengthen coordination and unity. Taking our makeshift hospital as an example, there were not so many medical teams in our hospital. Compared with Wuhan Keting Makeshift Hospital, where more than 10 medical teams were working together, our makeshift hospital was supported by the Maternal and Child Health Hospital of Hubei Province and supported by the Emergency Medical Rescue Team from Fujian and Sichuan Province and the medical teams from Shandong, Sichuan and Hebei Province. The designated hospital was the 5th People's Hospital of Wuhan. Our Shandong medical team was temporarily assembled with 303 members from 150 hospitals of 16 cities. How can such a mixed team form as quickly as possible as a joint force? The answer is unified scheduling, close cooperation, you can't do it alone or the efficiency will be too low. My second suggestion is to enhance informatization construction. Let's look at the picture above. This is the protective clothing we wore in the hospital. The protective goggle will become dim caused by fog arising from long time wearing. It will be quite difficult for the wearer to complete various records and operations. The accuracy of patient information is very important, so the cooperation inside and outside of the isolation area is quite important. Therefore, advanced informatization facilities are required, which will reduce much unnecessary repeated work. The third thinking is about psychological counseling and humanitarian care, which is quite important for the patients, as I learned in the makeshift hospital. Because the patients in the makeshift hospital were easily anxious, the medical staff needed to provide more psychological counseling to them. Our Shanto medical team established the Hanyang Makeshift Hospital Family Group and posted the QR code on our clothes. Patients could directly scan the QR code to enter the group, given that we were wearing the protective clothing in the hospital. And there were too many patients. We didn't have much time to communicate with them, so we used the WeChat group to communicate with the patients. We arranged at least three of our teammates on duty every day to offer 24-hour online services. We answered the questions of the patients. We carried out anxiety and depression psychological tests. The counseling team screened patients for severe psychological problems based on the test results. We conducted one-on-one -on -one focused psychological intervention this walking QR code was quite popular among patients. More than 230 patients joined this group 
and our teammate conducted psychological counseling for 232 patients. Sent more than 1,000 replies, spent over 10,000 working hours, received more than 350 praises from patients. Our walking QR code, reported by many media, including CCTV News, China.com, China.org.cn, and Xinhua Net, etc., and achieved good social effect. We also established a nucleic acid positive patient group. Some patients felt anxious when they saw the negative results of others. Therefore, we provided medication guidance and psychological counseling, especially to patients with basic diseases and report, were reported nucleic acid positive. For these patients, we focused on the entire process of management and developed detailed and standardized diagnostic procedures for them, and invited our professional psychologists to provide them with counseling, which. Promoted effectively the patient's psychological rehabilitation, we received unanimous recognition and praise from patients. So our Shandu medical team achieved not only three zeros but four zeros. The fourth one was zero complaint. Finally, I'd like to quote again the words of Academia Wang Chen. The construction of the makeshift hospital. Benefits from professional judgment, decisive decision, and collective strength. Promoted by the decision of the central steering group, all forces inside and outside of Wuhan acted quickly. Makeshift hospitals was completed and opened in a short time, with the decisive decisions of the central government. The collective strength of the medical and health circles and relevant government departments. Makeshift hospitals became a major innovation during the fight against coronavirus. As a new model for responding to large-scale public health events, the concept of makeshift hospitals needs further thought and reflection. This is helpful for the construction of social governance system in capacity. For instance, prior to the construction of new convention and exhibition centers. Stadiums and railway stations in the future, space layout, ventilation system, and related facilities interface should be considered during design stage. This can be implemented as a national standard for large public facility construction in the future. A makeshift hospital can be used as a mature and useful experience for future large-scale epidemic prevention and control. Now the novel coronavirus outbreak is a global pandemic. Other countries can learn from our experience to tackle the epidemic. At present, the novel coronavirus is rapidly spreading across the world. Makeshift hospitals are under construction or have already been put into operation in some countries. China has accumulated some experiences in the construction, management, and operation of makeshift hospitals. Which can be shared with countries around the world. We provide Chinese solution to the world. We work together to fight the epidemic. Finally, I would like to say that I do hope the epidemic come to an early end and wish the people of the world healthy. Thank you. Thank you, Li Yuanzhang's 分享。从之前的一些视频和媒体报道中。Thank you directly for sharing. From previous video and media reports, we have some intuitive understanding of the mobile cabin hospital. Many patients wave goodbye to the medical staff in great emotion. Derek Liu, with his first-hand experience in Wuhan for over a month, he will share with us the construction, management, and operation of the mobile cabin hospitals. As well as the treatment of patients there, as a major innovation in China's response to the epidemic, we also see that some other countries are learning from this model. Next, we will be connected with the Henan Provincial People's Hospital Director Chen Chuanliang on February the 13th. Director Chen, as the leader of the fifth batch of medical team in Henan Province to assist in Wuhan Qingshan Mobile Cabin Hospital, on March the ninth, Qingshan Mobile Cabin Hospital sent off the last recovered patient and closed with honor 
At present, Director Chen has returned to Zhengzhou. We would ask Director Chen to share how did Qingshan Mobile Capping Hospital handed over a great answer sheet in this endeavor. Please direct the screen to Director Chen. Hello, everyone. I'm Chen Chuanliang from Henan People's Hospital, and I'm the leader of the fifth batch of medical rescue team from Henan Province, responding to President Xi's call and assisting Wuhan to fight the new coronavirus epidemic. Now, I will give you a brief introduction to my one month work fighting the epidemic and taking charge of a Wuhan makeshift hospital. Hello, everyone. I'm Chen Chuanliang from Henan People's Hospital. I'm also the leader of the fifth batch of medical rescue team to Wuhan from Henan Province. Viruses know no borders, and the international community needs to work together to fight against it. Among which, the most important thing is to harness mutual understanding, trust, and support across borders. The director of the WHO Joint Mission on COVID-19 once said, "China has set up a good example. In China's scientific spirits and efficient institutions are of great reference to the world in fighting COVID-19." The coronavirus epidemic engulfed Wuhan at the end of 2019. The rapid spread of population movements across the country during the Spring Festival. Put even heavier a burden on the prevention and control of the epidemic. In accordance with the key decisions of the Party Central Committee and the State Council, the National Health Committee coordinated national medical resources and medical teams to support Hubei, worst hit by the epidemic. Go where there is epidemic, fight till it perishes. Henan Provincial People's Hospital fully grasped. The importance and urgency of epidemic prevention and control. In the late night of February the eighth, after receiving superior's direction, rapid deployment was made, and in the early morning of February the ninth, we established an elite medical rescue team encompassing professional and experienced personnel. To fight against the epidemic together, saving lives is of paramount importance. Go where there is epidemic, fight it till it perishes. We raced against the clock to assist Wuhan, determined to fight the epidemic, save lives, and live up to the expectation bore on our shoulders. Under the strong leadership of the party and the government. We were determined to fight and win this battle against the epidemic by mobilizing all resources to intercept and block the spread of the virus. When we arrived in Wuhan on the evening of February the ninth, the local staff sent us to the hot hotel, while we communicated closely with the local personnel concerning the work coordination. On February the tenth. We organized a meeting between medical rescue team and liaison officers from all regions to brief on the docking situation of the assistance regions, and to designate specific responsibilities to each group from different cities and regions in Henan Province, and to apply for the establishment of medical, nursing, logistics, and information teams. We organized training on the use of protective equipment. To ensure that every team member was well protected, paying attention to both physical and mental health of each of each of them, and each group wasted no time then holding a meeting to discuss specific schedule and arrangements. On February the eleventh, we rushed to Qingshan Makeshift Hospital to make final preparation before stepping up to the front line and fight. On February the thirteenth. We started receiving patients in the makeshift hospital. At the same time, 42,000 medical staff nationwide came to Hubei Province and Wuhan City to support. It's fair to say that the operation of makeshift hospitals 
is tied with life and future. This is the layout of the makeshift hospital. Let me introduce some of the detailed work in the makeshift hospital. Xingshan Makeshift Hospital was renovated from Wisco Sports Center. It was divided into two cabins, A and B, with nearly 400 beds, mainly designated to treat patients with mild symptoms. All the beds were bunk beds, on top of the upper berth, brand new storage box and electric heating blanket were laid, while on the lower one, bed clothes and a new thick winter coat were put in place, along with the night bed and a table light beside it. In the public area, books were on the shelves for reading, together with abundant supplies of hot water, microwave oven, bread, instant noodles, and etc. This is the arrangement of beds inside Qingshan Makeshift Hospital. On February the 13th, the medical team officially entered the Qingshan Makeshift Hospital and began treating patients at afternoon. On February the 15th, due to the emergency of Jianghan Makeshift Hospital, 50 doctors in the fifth batch of medical rescue team were reallocated to support there. On March the 5th, the two cabins of Qingshan Makeshift Hospital, A and B combined. On March the 9th, the hospital wrapped up its operation. A total of 519 COVID-19 patients were admitted to the hospital, of whom 372 patients were cured and discharged, and 147 with critical condition were transferred to Wuhan Ninth Hospital. In total, 1,386 patients had their throats swabbed in the cabin. After nearly a month's work, I have summed up some experiences. First, we should pay attention to the organizational construction and strengthen the ideology. If we want to win the war against the epidemic, we must have, have iron discipline and obey the commanding all actions. On the second day after arriving in Wuhan, the fifth batch of medical team submitted the application to Henan Provincial Health Committee for the establishment of a temporary party committee to her, and was instantly approved. We assessed expertise and capabilities and set up professional teams, infection control groups, medical groups, and nursing groups accordingly. For the infection control group, an organizational structure needed to be established. We selected person with rich experience as a group leader and person with experience in hospital infection control management from eight medical groups and 16 nursing groups. The infection control group team members conducted rigorous protection work to guarantee that every member of the team could enter and leave the cabin safely and met the requirements of zero infection of medical staffs. With the rigorous work standard and in combination with the actual situation of the mobile cabin hospital, we formulated an infection control system as well as a procedure manual stating 14 key points of infection prevention and control detailing the steps of wearing and removing protective gears and standardizing the work process of the cabin infection control nurses. We strengthened the protection training, took infection control management training as an important premise, foundation and guarantee, organized training for 250 medical and nursing personnel from 49 different medical institutions in the province, including the use of protective gear, knowledge of infection control, 
work responsibilities and work processes, so that each team member is familiar with the protection process. A total of more than over more than seven hundred personnel received the training. On-site inspection was conducted, given that the vitality of each infection control institution and procedures lies in full implementation. Supervisions and inspection was an important means to promote the implementation of infection control measures. An important way to continuously improve and refine the infection control management, and a key measure to ensure the safety of medical personnel. This picture showed how we strengthened the training, and the ultimate goal was that everyone is proficient in the infection control knowledge and the infection control process. The second group is the medical group, with grid management implemented. Fifty doctors were divided into four groups. We also refined the consultation criteria. Many patients had various underlying diseases such as diabetes, hypertension, coronary heart disease, and COPD, all of which need multidisciplinary consultation. In order to ensure the effectiveness of the treatment, we selected 50 doctors from the medical team to form a consultation expert group. And this group had consulted in total of over 1,500 patients. We combined use of traditional Chinese medicine and Western medicine. After receiving patients in the hospital, the leader of the medical group set up a TCM group, formulated the implementation scheme of TCM in Qingshan Makeshift Hospital. And the TCM patrol system, and also cooperated with relevant research projects of the state administration of traditional Chinese medicine, reporting the usage of TCM every day, with a total of 120 complete reports on TCA, TCM submitted. In the process, we accumulated detailed data for the anti-epidemic use of traditional Chinese medicine. Psychotherapy and sports assist rehabilitation. The medical group actively contacted professional music therapists, making full use of the broadcasting equipment in the cabin, and provided music therapy and psychological counseling. The medical group paid special attention to some patients with insomnia, depression, and other negative emotions. The medical group also encouraged patients to carry out appropriate exercises in the cabin to facilitate their recovery. The third is nursing group. Two hundred nurses were divided into four groups, with each group selecting the person with strong expertise and management experiences as a group leader. Each group was further subdivided into four groups, with each group have a group leader for management. We established human resource management system, according to the internal layout of Qingshan Makeshift Hospital and the number of beds. Thirteen duty areas were divided inside two compartments, and a twenty-four hour shift system was established to ensure sufficient rest for nurses. We also established a training system, mandating a three-day advanced training prior to entering service in the makeshift hospital. And training programs of which encompassed basic knowledge, personal protection, disinfection, and isolation. And after entering the hospital, specific training was given with the combination approach both online and offline, including various nursing operation specifications, work responsibilities for each shift, rules and regulations, emergency treatment, psychological equivalents. Etc. Based on specific needs, we set, we set up three nursing stations, which were duty shift, assistant shift, and supply shift. The duty shift nurses were mainly responsible for ward inspection, condition monitoring, treatment, health education, in and out of hospital handling, psychological care, cabin cleaning and disinfection, etc. The assistant nurses and supply nurses. Had other designated responsibilities. 
in line with relevant regulations and institutions, and in combination with the actual conditions. The work institution team compiled the working process and regulations in Wisco Sports Center Qingshan Makeshift Hospital, which comprised three parts: nursing work system, nursing post responsibilities, and nursing operation process. We paid great attention to humanitarian cares, to the physical and mental state of every nurse. We required nurses to report their body temperature every day, and report immediately in case of any respiratory symptoms and other discomfort. All of which were then summarized to form a daily report, so that management directors could be dynamically notified of the physical conditions of nurses. And take effective measures in time when necessary. Third, to stabilize the supply of materials and to ensure frontline protection, we set up a logistic group to actively communicate with local medical institutions and coordinate the supply of materials. We formulated a material management system, taking note of inventory of all hospital materials and make re- registration. Preparing protective supplies for personnel entering the cabin each day so as to ensure their safety. We saw the imp- we saw to the implementation of the management system. We received goods and materials from the society in strict accordance with the regulated procedures. After the cabin was closed, the remaining materials would be donated to the ninth hospital in Wuhan. The establishment of logistic support team and the streamlined procedures had laid a solid foundation for fighting against COVID-19 and tackling with emergencies. Fourth, to step up efforts in publicity, publicity and mobilization, we heartened determination to fight against the epidemic and established a publicity team, mainly responsible for the publicity work of the medical team, including taking over the Qingshan Makeshift Hospital, their daily work. Touching deeds during work, daily work summaries, daily monitoring of physical condition of each member and team cultural activities. Our team members wrote six articles reporting the fight against the epidemic in total, including two articles to Chinese Society of Nursing. We also wrote five hundred and eighty-one media reports, ranking the top among all medical teams nationwide. At nine a.m. on March the ninth. With the discharge of the last batch of eighteen cured patients, Wuhan Qingshan Makeshift Hospital cleared all patients and officially announced its closure. The fifth batch of Hunan Medical Team in Wuhan, in Hubei, won the battle, lasting nearly an entire month. Through the above measures, alongside grid management scheme, we set up a number of groups according to the medical situation. Finally. Through our endeavor, we achieve the four zeros, namely zero medical sta- staff infection, zero death, zero reoccurrence, and zero complaint. We have roundly completed the phased goal of epidemic prevention and control, and secured the victory. We return to Zhengzhou, Henan Province, from Wuhan, on March the nineteenth. And this is a picture showing people from our hometown gave us warm welcome upon our arrival. As President Xi said, "We are bound to win this battle against epidemic, and we firmly believe that." Thank you all. Thank you, Director Chen. In the 26 days of anti-epidemic efforts, zero medical staff infection, zero death of patient, zero recurrent infection, zero safety incident. This is very hard to come by. The result owes to the fastest build-up of the medical team, the highest speed moving into the cabin, the earliest use of TCM therapies, and the strictest discipline. Afterwards. Health news will continue to report and demonstrate relevant experiences. 
Coming next is the online roundtable session. Due to circumstances, the experts cannot engage in face-to-face -face dialogue, but this online forum will facilitate the exchange of our ideas, the sharing of experiences. Now I will hand over the floor to the Vice Director of uh, Zhongshan Hospital affiliated to Fudan University, Dr. Zhu Chouwen. Director Zhu is the leader of the medical team of Zhongshan Hospital dispatched to Hubei, and the medical team he led took over two infectious disease ICU in the eastern world of the People's Hospital affiliated to Wuhan University. At present, he's still in Wuhan. Please direct the screen to Director Zhu. Dear colleagues and friends, good evening, and for our international audiences, maybe good morning. It is my honor to be invited to attend this session and be the moderator of the roundtable session. I'm very also happy to see Director Liu, Director Li. It's my great honor and pleasure to see you in person, to summarize experiences and share it with uh, the rest of the world. Before the live streaming event, actually, the organizing committee has collected some questions from overseas community. And also, based on the questions raised during the live streaming, I'd like to um, share these questions for joint discussion. Let's refer to the screen first. This question is from Algeria. Je suis le docteur Dédou, médecin et réanimateur, hospital universitaire de la faculté de médecine d'Alger. Je suis le chef de service de l'unité d'anesthésie et réanimation pédiatrique du CHU Mustapha Bacha de la ville d'Alger, en Algérie. Je suis aussi le vice-président de la société savante d'anesthésie et réanimation des soins intensifs et des urgences. Je voudrais, si vous le permettez, vous poser euh, trois questions. La première concerne le confinement. Aujourd'hui, samedi 21 mars 2020, nous sommes à 135 cas confirmés et 11 décès. Est-ce que vous ne pensez pas qu'il serait déjà temps de pratiquer le confinement pour éviter l'épidémie de grande masse Ma deuxième question concerne le dépistage rapide que vous avez à votre niveau. Est-ce que cet appareil est fiable et qu'est-ce que vous en pensez Quelle est votre expérience Ma troisième question concerne, bien sûr, le traitement. Qu'en pensez-vous du traitement à la chloroquine associée à l'azithromycine Je vous remercie. This video was from the largest medical institution of Algeria, University Hospital of Mustafa. He is the director of uh, pediatric anesthesia, Dr. Dero. He raised three questions. The first question is about uh, the containment of the virus. By 2020, March 21st, Saturday, Algeria already have 135 confirmed cases with 11 dead. Do you think it is still a good timing to prevent the virus from massive spreading? The second question is, what is your thoughts on the rapid test method for COVID-19 in China and other countries, regions, and its reliability? The third question is also a very hard question. What's your take on the combined use of a hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin to treat confirmed cases? How about we ask uh, Derek Liu to answer the questions first? Thank you, Director Drew. Thank you, friend from Algeria. Let me answer your question. March 21st, WHO announced COVID-19 has entered into pandemic area. There are already over 300,000 confirmed cases, so the situation is dire. However, there are still some efforts can be made to make it better. Facing the epidemic, there are no 
borders. We should uh, help each other, support each other to contain the epidemic as much as possible. Although we don't have uh, very effective drugs against the uh, virus, but we have some uh, effective methods to contain it. The first one is to uh, cut off the source of uh, infection and to protect the general public from infection sources. In China, we separate confirmed cases and suspected cases with uh, the general public. And also on February the 13th, Wuhan has uh, started a very important management measures and have uh, quarantined as much as possible suspected and confirmed cases in short notice. And also Wuhan city established uh, new hospitals, uh, mobile cabin hospitals. All these measures have successfully contained the virus from further spreading. But I must emphasize that different nations have different uh, situation and specifics. We cannot just copy Chinese model but it can be taken reference of. We cannot just copy Chinese model. We must consider local specifics to come up with a, an effective method. So to answer the second question about uh, the rapid test and diagnosis method and its reliability, at present, there are two theories to diagnose a disease. The most important is to detect whether there is such pathogen within the patients. There are two ways. The first one is a nuclear acid, the level of a protein of the pathogen. And for COVID-19, it is also true. In all the testing and detection, nuclear acid is the most flexible and highly specific, so very effective. Therefore, nuclear acid test method is used and played a critical role to test uh, the virus. And also there is an IDM uh, method. It is the antigen serology testing method. So. Sometimes uh, the nucleic acid test result is negative, but we use as IDN or IGN. We can use it clinically to identify whether these patients have been infected or not. So nucleic acid, even if it's uh, negative, therefore nucleic acid as the method is used and compared with uh, other respiratory viruses, nuclear acid is very effective and it largely depends on the collection of uh, samples. We should uh, train medical staff to successfully collect the samples. For example, compared with a uh, nose swab, we should use a minimally intrusive swab method, and also we should consider the transportation of the sample and using specific uh, test kit and ensuring appropriate lab procedures. All these things are very important. And to answer the third question, just now, Director Zhu has mentioned that it's a very hard uh, topic. The combined use of uh, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin have been applied to 36 cases, and I have been paying attention to their progress. In six days, their virus conversion rate has reached 100%. The negative conversion rate has reached uh, 100%, and also U.S. President Trump also mentioned the combined use of uh, the two had the chance to become a real real game changer. So for that, my opinion, actually in the sixth and seventh edition of uh, Chinese uh, drug usage, it has mentioned in treating these uh, patients, we try to use them, apply them on the patient with uh, not very significant efficacy being observed. 
and also it is difficult to apply and administer the right dosage, otherwise it will cause a severe side effect. But uh, in terms of uh, the combined use of uh, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycine, I think we, we, we are still in the exploratory stage. There are no reliable material to prove that its efficacy or not. However, there is no credible proof claiming that uh, any specific drug are effective to treat and cure COVID-19. Currently, we should adopt a meticulous and careful mentality in using and applying drugs. And there are many drugs, their efficacy are observed on a theoretical basis or on some initial uh, experiments, but it's hard to say whether it's truly effective or not. Maybe there are some political reasons behind it to pacify the general public. In the life science area, sometimes uh, people are not uh, entirely relying on the facts, but we should adopt a scientific mentality to prove it. So this is my answer to the three questions. Thank you, Derek Liu. You not only answered the three questions, but also you mentioned very important principles in clinical application of medication. Thank you. The second question is from Nancy from Peru. The question is, compared with the fever patients, COVID-19, what are its more representative symptoms? If PCR is uh, false negative, what is your approach or method to cope with it? I'd like to ask uh, Director Chen to share your experience. Thank you, Director Zhu. And thank Professor Nancy, a very professional question about COVID-19, the typical symptoms for adults, fever, coughing, fatigue are the major symptoms. For some minorities, they have a, a pain in the throat and nose. And for severe cases, for example, they might encounter respiratory difficulties after one week or low oxygen level in their blood. For even more severe cases, it might evolve into comprehensive and acute respiratory disease. Even faint. Or they can have a metabolic uh, acid poison. Even the organs can fail eventually. But for some people, they don't have uh, obvious symptoms. And for children and newborn babies, they don't have uh, typical symptoms. They have uh, diarrhea or some other digestive system symptoms. Or they just feel tired, fatigue, or with very short breath. And also for pregnant women, uh, we should adopt a similar clinical approaches with uh, the same age of people. And there are certainly some false negative cases because the nuclear acid test is not 100% accurate. So negative forces do exist. CDC of China will not only test uh, nuclear acid, but we also test uh, the serology and antibody. Nuclear acid has two types and two situations. The first one is to test uh, the respiratory secretions. 
including uh, throat uh, swab. And also, there are medication and drug tests. In order to test uh, the antibody in the serology, so we use both qualitative and quantitative method to test the IDG, IgM and IDG, the antibody of a nucleic acid, IDG and IgM. Secondly, genetic testing. At present, there are two types of genetic testing. ORF ORF and 1AB 1AB The third one ORF is ORF and 1G and EG and NG ORF ORF are positive consecutively for two times and it will be confirmed and that also applies to ORF. If ORF is negative, only EG and NG are positive, then a re-examination must be performed. This is my answer to the question. I'm not, I'm not sure if it uh, uh, answers your question. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Let's take a look at another question from Romania. He said, uh, because we do not have uh, sufficient testing equipment, many fever patients or patients feel uncomfortable visit the hospital. So from a hospital management perspective, how to identify them as soon as possible to prevent the virus from spreading in the hospital? Director Liu, please, can you answer the questions and share your points? Thank you, Director Zhu and thanked friend from Romania. In China, the comprehensive uh, hospitals have a fever department. So all fever patients must be categorized by this department and then sent to different uh, clinic setting. And a very important work of the doctor is to inquire the patient very elaborately whether this fever patient has close contact history with uh, COVID-19 patients. So to inquire the medical history of these patients, if the answer is yes, and then the patient has some respiratory symptoms, even if uh, there are no uh, sufficient nucleic acid result, but uh, clinically, we can uh, detect uh, the lymph cells, whether they are at a normal level or not. And also combined with the CT test, as well as uh, a member test, the so white blood cells level, to clinically diagnose the patient. And also uh, COVID-19 has some similarities with uh, influenza A and influenza B. So we start from suspected cases, and then nucleic acid will be applied to confirm the cases. If we identify suspected cases, we will quarantine him or her to a designated site for specific treatment. And after nucleic acid test, we will then allocate and transfer him or her to the designated hospital to prevent cross-contamination or infection within the hospital to protect the patients with other diseases. Thank you. Thank you, Director Liu. I'd like to ask a follow-up question. This question is from Harris Paris from Peru. He asked, what are the most important factors to safeguard medical staff? So it is about some management and uh, legal uh, perspectives. I think this question includes two aspects. At least that is my understanding of the question. First, thank you, Carlos Perez, for asking the question. The first aspect is about uh, the safety and the protection of the medical staff. Indeed, it is very important. There are several points I'd like to make. For one, in the work zones within the hospital, there must be a very clear division of different zones 
the contaminated zones, semi-contaminated zones, and non-contaminated zones. And there must be very clear signage indicating different zones, in particular in the egress and ingress points of uh, the contaminated zone. There must be specific personnel to monitor the egress and ingress of people. For example, in our hospital, there are professional personnel to monitor the egress and ingress, and they are indicators. Secondly, a training must be performed. So that involves uh, all the personnel in the hospital, not just the physicians and nurses, but also the security guards and all the working staff in the hospital. And thirdly, the protection of the medical staff. It depends on the specific tasks he or she is performing. For instance, in a cleaned zone, maybe level one protection is needed, but in the semi-contaminated or contaminated areas, for example, personnel responsible for imaging or delivery of samples, they should uh, follow level two protection protocol. And for contaminated zones, they must uh, adhere to level three protocols. So that means they must uh, wear a protective suit and facial mask. And the second aspect of the question about uh, protocols, I think uh, this is different uh, in China. China, the predominant uh, models are uh, public hospitals, and medical staff in the public hospitals can enjoy all the benefits in terms of compensation, medical insurance, and specific subsidies from the government. For example, in Wuhan, we came to the rescue of Wuhan, and this is a special occasion. After the outbreak, no one single medical staff requested to go back. So for Chinese medical staff, we volunteer to aid other cities. It is also their obligation. They went to where they are most needed. So there's no uh, agreement being assigned to mo mobilize, to motivate the medical staff. They went there voluntarily. Thank you, Director Lu. Another question. If we don't have sufficient protection materials at the very start of the outbreak, how will you distribute the medical resources and materials? Speaking of medical materials, I think it's a matter of uh, logistics. When the outbreak just took place, we encountered similar difficulties. Medical materials and resources are very hard to come by. However, our logistics re relies on the concerted efforts of everybody. When people enter into the quarantine zones or the endemic areas, they will be provided with uh, medical uh, materials. I ask my medical team to share all of our medical resources. We are in it together to solve the problem. Thank you. Thank you, Director Liu. Yes, Mr. Mustafa from Egypt, he asked, in a special time, how many respirators, how many ventilators are needed for a hundred bed? So it depends on your specific situation and department. If you're in an ICU, then you need a uh, the same number of uh, ventilators with the beds. But there are some patients that they can't be taken into the ICU because it's full. So the hospital should prepare more ventilators. Just like Director Liu has mentioned, we encountered shortages of uh, medical resources, including ventilators. And later on, when the logistics and supply went up, we can use all instrument to save more patients. And I'd like to remind you for our overseas uh, fellow practitioners, you should prepare 
whether the oxygen level is adequate or not. I think this is also critical because under these circumstances, we need a very high volume of uh, uh, ventilators to oxygenize the patient. But uh, in the, some hospitals, the level of oxygen in the mechanical pumps, uh, tubes, are not sufficient. So we are also adjusting the pressure within the wards to solve the problem. So ventilator is one thing, but we also should concern with ourselves with uh, the level of oxygen. And another question from uh, Brian from Ecuador, he asked, how long will it take for the epidemic to be controlled or eliminated, eliminated based on your experience? I think now it has entered into global pandemic, so Chinese solution alone cannot address it entirely. It takes some time. The previous directors have mentioned if we implement strict uh, quarantine measures like uh, city lockdowns to cut off uh, the source of the infection, from this perspective, and then uh, we treat infected patients for Wuhan city, the most severe zones after two months, the new confirmed cases have been reduced to one digit and even zero. But this does not mean and does not represent the global situation because we are now in a global village. We are facing global pandemic. We cannot stop movement of people in the world. So we and the rest of the world, we are adopting a measure to cut off the source of infection. Speaking of which, Maybe we, we thought that the temperature is going up, maybe the epidemic will be contained. However, we still found uh, COVID-19 patients in South America. So this reminds us we should stay vigilant. We should not only care about uh, the imported cases, but also uh, domestic cases. In particular, if we had, if we didn't successfully monitor these uh, a few cases, then it will waste all our previous efforts. Just like a previous colleagues have mentioned, the cutoff of uh, infection source are the most critical thing to do. We spent a lot of uh, energy on it. So from this perspective. Uh, I cannot really give a time, like how long will it take to eliminate the virus, but it, re it is really a global effort. We are in a global village, and from this perspective, we should join hands to fight against it. I think this one overseas expert that is trying to be connected. Is that right? Yes, this uh, overseas expert is already online and connected.
呃，这位专家，呃，这位外国专家，呃，声音有一些故障。This overseas expert encountered some technical issues. Please take off your headset. We cannot hear you. 朱院长，哎，朱院长，呃，咱们可以先继续。We can proceed to answer other questions. Okay, wait a minute. Let me review some of the questions. There's one question. He said the loss of uh, the sense of smell and the sense of taste. So the, is this symptom also related to COVID-19? I don't know if uh, the other three directors encounter similar situations in your treatment. In our world, I didn't encounter similar situation. The loss of the sense of the smell and the sense of uh, taste. So I think this is a neurological damage, right? In my word, I mean for COVID-19 patients, uh, we only observe damages to the, in the lung, and also in the heart, in the cardio system. But for other organs, I think it is more of a neurological uh, damage. I didn't encounter similar uh, situations. So it might be an individual case. We need to do more work to understand the nature of it. <coughs> Another question, from a biosafety perspective, is N95 uh, facial mask effective to prevent the virus from spreading? So which director would like to answer the question? Is N95 facial mask effective? I think N95 from our usage in the mobile cabin hospital, N95 facial masks were used to better protect people. We even added an additional layer with ropes on it to make it tight and it will be sufficient. It can reduce the risks of uh, being infected. From our ex experience, N95 can effectively prevent the virus from spreading. Thank you. There are some residue lung damage that have been observed. So, will any follow up visits be made regarding the residue lung damage? It takes some time to observe. I would suggest to have a regular follow-up visit with the hospital to observe the impact of COVID-19 on lung. It's different from SARS. Now, based on our observations and in the literature and in our clinical side, we believe, uh, compared to SARS for COVID-19, the fibrosis of uh, lung is not as significant as uh, SARS. So it's not necessarily will result in residual lung damage, but it takes some time. It is a process. So there must be follow-up recuperation phase. And since this is a new disease, I think still we need some uh, observation to evaluate residue lung damage and how will it affect lung in the long term. We need more 
materials and more time to answer this question more precisely. But after the patient is uh, sent off a hospital, uh, the patient can do some uh, exercises like deep breathing. I think these are necessary recuperation techniques. I believe uh, every medical unit, including the ones in the Wuhan hospital, they will more or less use uh, uh, GC, glucocorticoid. Mm -hmm. So can you share with us uh, what's your take on the usage of uh, GC? So we took over Qingshan Mobile Carbon Hospital this time. We admit in mild cases. We admit 519 mild cases. We have a 73% of cure rate. And so far, we have not used a GC. But my point is, uh, Director Liu has also mentioned this point. Uh, I was responsible for the imaging. So for the over 500 patients, I look at uh, the image of their lungs. And it's fair to say that over 75% of patients have a very, very good uh, lung performances after the treatment. After over 15 days of uh, uh, positive treatment and TCM therapies and Western therapies combined, they have uh, recovered rapidly. And over 80% of the patients have had a very good uh, recuperation. Only a small portion of patients had more uh, difficulties in recuperation. And for those patients, they have some uh, existing diseases like diabetes. So for them, it takes a longer time to fully recuperate. And there's another phenomenon. For women that are obese, their uh, recuperation speed is not good, as good as uh, the others. So these are just some of our observations. And we still need to follow up uh, uh, visit to understand more. Let me add some point regarding GC. The applying of GC to treat lung damages caused by viruses from SARS to COVID-19. SARS took place like uh, more than 10 years ago. We used uh, a large dosage of uh, GC in our Hospital. There are still some patients have been uh, badly affected by SARS, and they are still in our hospital even after 10 years. However, if we apply GC at early stage and with a moderate dosage, we can consider use it. And if we found it useful, we will continue to use it for some time, for three to five days. We observe whether the symptoms of the patient is uh, improved or not. If there's no significant improvement, then we will uh, reduce the dosage and be more cautious. GC is a double-edged sword. If misused, it will cause uh, many terrible side effects, like a uh, uh, further infections or uh, make it worse. So clinical-wise, we are exercise caution to apply GC on different patients. If this patient has very severe COVID-19 symptoms and there are no other alternatives, then we might try using GC to treat the patient. Thank you. For my medical unit, we've been engaged in a research we are also using AI to read uh, the lung image and also to observe the medication efficacy 
So we are adopting a stratified philosophy to guide the administration of drugs. Now we are engaged in this research, just like Director Liu mentioned, uh, this type of uh, drugs are a double-edged sword. Hormone can be used well to treat disease, but if misused, it can also cause great damage. Is our overseas patient, overseas expert online now? This overseas expert from Ecuador has lost the connection. Did he write down the question? Uh, we might, we can answer the question next time. Thank you. I think it's about time to adjourn the webinar. Uh, can I take a few minutes to summarize the other directors what they have said? I'll use English. Oh, thank you very much for all the participants around the world. Today, our topic is Chinese solution and global sharing. Really, we want to share our experiences and approach uh, from what we have done in China to end the uh, COVID-19, uh, this uh, uh, kind of disaster. Actually, we have been uh, attacking this uh, phenomena for more than two months. And we have some experiences, such as uh, very solid isolation and also a very uh, solid and strict epidemiology study. And also we have also tried some uh, the clinical therapy for these patients. I want to mention that in China, our National Health Commission issued from version one to version seven, the recommended protocol for diagnosis and treatment for COVID-19, which give us a very, very good, like somewhat like guidelines for health professionals to do our work. More or in addition, these recommendation protocols from our National Health Commission also give us some waiver of the responsibilities for those drugs which have not been strictly tested or approved in the normal time. So that we may use these drugs which might show some relative or some uh, parts of the efficacy to treat the patient. That, but this also depends on the capacity of the team working together in the clinical first line to make the decision, to make the comprehensive decision for these kind of drugs. So I think these recommendation protocols by our National Health Commission version one to version seven are very helpful for around the world of health professionals to take a look to see the progress or the evolution of our working in China. But we still have to keep in mind, like the President uh, Liu Ximing mentioned, some of the therapies we recommend here are not totally approved using our methodological studies, such as RCT or somewhat. But some are the uh, observation or exper experimental studies. But this does not stop us to have more observation and a test for these drugs. So I think the experiences from China is not only from the policy, but in a clinical way. But each country have its own condition and have its own characteristic, the social system and the mechanisms of responding for this uh, uh, pandemic. So we said, this is our experiences and we want to share with a global uh, colleagues, 
but we also like we are willing to share your experiences uh, for this uh, contact, uh, for the treating or control the COVID-19 epidemically. As I said in Chinese that this is a global village. We need to work together. Nobody can do their job by their own. We need to work together and compete the disease together. So thank you, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Director Zhu and the experts. Thank you for your sincere exchange and selfless sharing. The spring of 2020 is destined to be unforgettable. An epidemic prevention and control battle made the countries in the world a community with shared destiny. Facing the epidemic, no country or nation can be isolated. This spring, we share with the world this valuable Chinese solution, passing on Chinese confidence and Chinese strength. We are willing to watch over and help the world, together looking forward to the brilliant sunshine after the storm. Now, Chinese solution global sharing will meet you in the future. Now, it's March 22nd, 10 35 p.m. This live streaming is adjourned. Thank you. Goodbye.